Okay, I stopped the recording. So everyone, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining today's session of the Research Institute at UBES. And today uh, we discussed absolutely an amazing topic that is digital uh, marketing. My name is Dr. Santelova. I am the director of UBES Research Institute and I welcome uh, today's remarkable speaker. Uh, can't see you yet, yes. Uh, Mr. Michael Norris. Michael, Hi, thank, thank you. Very much. Thank you very much for joining us. So, uh, Michael is the Chief Marketing Officer at UTAC. And UTAC is a kind of very important full service marketing agency. Please tell us more about what full service implies. Okay, that would be very interesting. Yeah, so I, I actually have just a couple slides on this too, so I can briefly go over it there as well. But uh, really, we do everything under the sun when it comes to digital marketing. So all the stuff that you would think of, social media, email, all that, plus uh, Google ads are really big for us, social media ads really big for us, SEO as well, content, video. Really, we try to do just about everything we can so that we're a one-stop right. shop. Brilliant. Uh, then one more question, Michael. Preparing for this session, of course, I Googled your name and I found, you know, uh, different interviews by you, also podcasts, and you are quite a regular speaker uh, in, you know, internet space. And uh, you also organize podcasts with Welber You, right? So tell us more a bit about Welber You. That would be interesting uh, as, as well. Yeah, so uh, Wilbur is, is my boss. He's my, my CEO of UTech. He's a phenomenal individual. He's younger than me, started our company about uh, 10 years ago from his parents' basement with $600 to his name. And uh, today we're, uh, we've got three locations across the United States. We're looking to expand outside of that. We're up to about 75 employees and uh, it's, all, it's all bootstrapped. No outside funds, anything like that. No fundraising. We've just kind of done it ourselves. So it's, wow. it's been a tremendous ride and Wilbur's our leader. He's, he's been there for us the whole way. That's amazing. You know, on this call, we are going to have some, some, some of our uh, DBA candidates doctoral business administration candidates they are the owners uh, of their own businesses as well as you know managers so uh, in different sectors of economy so absolutely I, I think that will be fascinating to to uh, listen to your presentation so Michael uh, the floor is yours so uh, I okay. believe that uh, you have like 25 30 minutes and or maybe more I mean let's see and then we will have the floor open for questions and answers. So thank you very much again. And go ahead. All right. Well, thank you all very much for coming today. I know uh, before we started recording here, we touched on the fact that it's Mother's Day in the United States. So to all the moms out there, we appreciate you very much. Um, I do have a presentation for you all today. It's about it's about 20 slides. I'll try to I'll try to go through it somewhat quickly. I just wanted to give us a little bit of a basis for the conversation today. Uh, you'll see this deck template is all designed up. I just took our normal decks that we use uh, at UTAC. So uh, ign ignore any kind of, you know, funny pictures or anything you might see in here, but it would look better than anything I could put together myself. I know marketing, I don't know design. I've got people for that. So um, without further ado, I'll kind of kick off today. Uh, we'll be talking about future trends and strategies in digital marketing. And so um, to go through that, I wanted to just give a little bit of a brief intro on myself. And I know that we kind of just did that a little bit too. So I'll really skip through that. But I want to let you guys know why I'm qualified to speak on this topic, right? I'm, I'm sure uh, that's kind of important to you. Uh, we'll look at a little bit of the present day and where things stand today in terms of search, advertising, and social media. Obviously, marketing extends outside of those three buckets. But I think just for the the time that we've allotted today, those are pretty good three to break down into. And from there, we'll look at a future channel breakdown. So uh, where is money starting to go? Where are people uh, thinking that things are going to continue into? Uh, what's going to get bigger? What's going to get smaller? We'll look at that a little bit too. And then future tactics as well. So not necessarily looking at things from a macro level, but looking at things from a, a small, you know, a little bit more of a minute level there and, and looking at those actual trends and tactics too. So moving forward, uh, my computer's going slow. One second here. Of course this happens to me while I'm recording a presentation, right? 
Do you still see the intro slide or do you see the next I still see to today's agenda, uh, Michael. Okay. And then on the side, there is a, I think it's you holding a dog. I don't know if it's you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, yep, that's me. So a uh, little bit of a breakdown on me. And again, we've already went through this, but I'm the CMO at UTAC. We're a $50 million digital marketing agency. Uh, I'm also the managing director for a company called Urban Matter, which is a Chicago-based entertainment media company, which also does a decent amount of digital marketing too. So I've got a couple different perspectives there. I've earned my MBA from uh, Southern New Hampshire University in the United States, did it all online. And uh, I'm a husband, I'm a dog dad. That's my dog, Bindi, in that picture right there. Um, I'm a pretty laid back guy. You guys might be able to tell by this picture. So if at any point throughout this, you have questions, you wanna type them in the chat, you wanna just shout them out. I'm totally okay with that. You're not going to bother me at all. You're not going to throw me off. So that's totally fine. And then just to give you a little bit of background on me, I love reading. I love video games. My undergrad is in philosophy. So I, I'm really into that too. Mythology, biology, nutrition. I just like to learn, I think at the end of the day. So um, that's, that's a little bit on me. Um, our agency, UTech, just so you guys know, we are premier Google partners. We're Facebook partners. We're partners with MailChimp, which is a really big email company. Shopify, which is a really big e-commerce um, website company. CallRail, they do call tracking, marketing, and also HubSpot, which is, uh, they, they actually invented the inbound marketing methodology, which is uh, pretty commonly used today too. So moving forward, again, this is UTAC. You know, we've been in all kinds of publications and stuff like that. I won't, I won't belabor the points, but these are, these are some of the different things that we do, just so you know what falls under the umbrella and you know what, what I've, uh, what, what kind of background I have. Um, I've done all kinds of stuff regarding influencer marketing, content, email, social, branding, all that kind of stuff, mobile apps, uh, mobile app marketing, mobile app development, search advertising, programmatic, OTT, pretty much you name it, we do it. So enough about me, let's actually get into this and let's look at marketing today. And that, that's Wilbur actually in the middle. I know we discussed him a little bit. He's our CEO. All right, so looking at present day today, uh, one of the biggest things when it comes to marketing is search. And there's a pretty good reason for that. And that's because when someone searches for something on the internet, you have a unique uh, opportunity to capture their capture them at that exact moment that they're looking for something that you have to offer which is very unique. And we didn't really have that in the past before search engines, because you'd, uh, you'd put an ad in a newspaper, you put an ad in a on the TV, you put an ad in a magazine, you know, you're, you're hitting people when they're doing something else, right? But with search, they're actively looking for what it is that you have to offer in that exact moment. And that's, that's, that's crazy. That, that type of intent never existed. And, and now that it does, you can see why Google is, is such a huge company, right? Um, and Google has 93% market share worldwide. Now, that's an absolutely crazy stat. I might call that a little bit of a monopoly. I don't know how, uh, how you all define things, but uh, to me, that's pretty crazy. And for that reason, Google's been kind of able to write the rules of the web. Uh, to some extent, Google will put out different things and say, hey, this is going to be our new algorithm. This is what we prioritize. And the whole internet kind of adopts that philosophy and then starts doing things in the way that Google wants them. So I'll give you a little bit of an example on that. Uh, one of these things that, that Google has done in the past was they, they said they didn't like intrusive pop-ups anymore. And so what they were going to do was penalize your website in the search engine results if you had intrusive pop-ups. Well, guess what? They went away for the most part because uh, that's a big thing. You know, Google has that ability to control that. And uh, while that may be, you know, some, some might consider that overstepping, it, it has been a, a positive, I would say, for the most part because Google's able to, you know, look at the user experience at the end of the day and them as a search engine, you know, pr primarily, obviously, you know, Google Alphabet, they do a lot of things today, but as a search engine, what they want to do is maintain that market share because that's where people run ads. That's where they get a lot of their income from. And they want to make sure that they remain the best search engine. And in remaining the best search engine, they have to think about the user on the other end at all given times. So something that they have put forth, and this is a, a little bit new, it's not totally new. It's been around for about a year or two now, uh, but they had a new algorithm change 
that was referred to as EAT, E-A-T. And that stands for expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. And those are three things that if you are writing any kind of content and publishing it on the web, Google wants to make sure that your author has the expertise to touch on that subject. They wanna make sure that your content is authoritative and, and actually makes sense. And they wanna make sure that your website is trustworthy. Because at the end of the day, if Google were to put something out that's not trustworthy, and let's say it ranks number one and you click on it and you start to uh, you know, see something and you're like, wait, that doesn't, that doesn't add up. Well, then you might wanna start using a different search engine. And that's the last thing they want. So um, right now, you know, I think it's, it's really good uh, in terms of the SEO industry and where that's going. And SEO stands for search engine optimization. Um, but where that's going is really, it, it's, I, I'll back up. I guess there used to be a ton of black hat tactics where people would uh, just throw keywords in their content over and over and over again, and they'd put a word in there a hundred times, and then they'd rank number one. Well, obviously that doesn't provide a good experience for the user. So that's, we're moving away from that and we're moving into this new era where the websites that are actually authoritative and trustworthy are the ones near the top. So that's, that's what people need to think about today. Um, and as far as main ranking factors for SEO, there, there are really three things. And I just touched on the content aspect, so I won't go into that again. But technical SEO is also uh, kind of an important thing for the web today, too. You want your website to load quickly. Uh, you want the hierarchy to be easily understood. You want people to be able to find what they're looking for. You want your images to be compressed so that they're not bloated and using more data on people's devices, things of that nature. And then as an additional vote of confidence for any given website, that's where links come in. So uh, one, of the, one of the most prominent things that we do for our SEO clients at UTAC is, is this activity called link building. And when it comes to link building, what you're essentially trying to do is get someone else's site to link back to yours. And that's what we know, that's what we call a backlink. Now, a backlink is really, really important in the eyes of a search engine because it's a vote of confidence from another site towards yours. If you think about it, let's say I started a new website today and I, uh, you know, I'm putting, I, I'll, I'll give you an example. I always use brown shoes as an example. I don't know why, but let's just call it mikesbrownshoes.com. Let's say I made that and you're coming to my site, you're looking at my brown shoes and well, I know another website that sells black shoes. And I know that my users might benefit from seeing me as someone who can refer them to someone who knows black shoes as well. So I would put a link on my website to a site for black shoes, and then that would be a vote of confidence to them. That's kind of how a backlink works. Now, not all backlinks are created equal. Uh, I will say, you know, a backlink from the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or uh, you know, some, some really prominent media organization is much different than getting one from mikesbrownshoes.com, which I just created, right? So there's, there's a lot of authority that plays into that too, but this is kind of the modern day search landscape. And we'll talk about what that looks like in the future in just a second as well. And I think I need to speed this up because I spent a lot of time on that. So I'll, uh, I'll get going a little bit quicker here. Looking at advertising today and a little bit of a breakdown, Google is absolutely dominating the market. Uh, as you can see, they're, they're number one on this graph with $168 uh, million, dollars, billion dollars, excuse me, in, in US dollars. Um, and this is a forecast for the year 2020. Now, while Google's number one, something else to consider is that Google also owns YouTube, which is also on this list at 35 billion. So again, you know, Google's just, they've got so much market share of that advertising industry. And in addition to that, there's one other company that, that really owns a lot of real estate here too, and that's Facebook, or also known as Meta, as they just changed their name to. They own both Instagram, Facebook, uh, and even beyond that, they own Facebook Messenger, they own WhatsApp, a uh, variety of other things too. Those two platforms essentially have a duopoly today. Over 50% of all online advertising revenue goes to either Google or Meta. And, and, that's, and that's crazy to think about. Amazon, distant third, very, very distant third. And they're, they're barely over, uh, you know, some of these other sites that, uh, you know, I, some of these I've never heard of, to be honest with you, as I'm looking at this graph. So uh, it's pretty crazy to see 
Uh, and obviously, you know, a lot of regulation is kind of coming into play today too. There's a lot of privacy concerns with these companies as they get a little bit bloated, bigger. Uh, they're not necessarily doing great things with people's data. So we might see this start to splinter and fragment a little bit, um, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit today too. And then social media. This is something else I wanted to touch on too. Uh, obviously, as you know, from what I just said, Facebook owns WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook Messenger. Those have a lot of users. If you look at this graph here on the right side, I mean, you'll see uh, Facebook is still the top. I know, you know, recently they've, they've been kind of falling off. They've gotten some bad press. Um, they actually had their first quarter where they, they reported a loss of users, which is pretty crazy to think about, but they're still at the top. So they're still in charge. YouTube is actually in second. And I know a lot of people don't think of YouTube as a social network. I can understand why you might not, and I'm not here to debate that today, uh, but it gen generally does get looped into social media networks when it comes into users, and YouTube has quite a few as well. Uh, and then TikTok, which is kind of the new kid on the block, TikTok is rolling in at, at number six right now, but the user growth there is, is tremendous. And it's primarily with uh, young, younger Gen Z folk and YouTube is also really, really big among that market too. So if we're thinking about the future and where this might go, well, TikTok's positioning itself pretty well uh, compared to some of these other channels. So why don't we take a look at the future then? First and foremost, search Google. It, it would be hard to unseat Google, right? With a 93% market share, you got to think that even five, 10 years down the road, for that to just completely erode underneath them, I, I don't see that happening. I still see them having at least, you know, at least 50% on the low end, uh, if anything were to, to come in and happen. But TikTok, very, very interestingly enough, I know we think of it as a social media network. I know we think of it as a place where people watch videos of people dancing and maybe now of recipes, things like that. It's turning into a search engine for Gen Z. And essentially what Gen Z will do is, uh, let's, let's say there's a recipe, right? My, my wife and I are, uh, we're, we've got some ribs in the crock pot upstairs for Mother's Day, we're, we're cooking those later. Well, what a, what a Gen Z person might do is, let's say they're looking for a recipe for ribs or, or any kind of food like that. They'll go into the TikTok app search for a recipe for ribs, and they'll watch videos on it. And those, those videos are, are quick, they're easy, they're, they're snappy, and they, they show you how you might go about cooking something. Well, that's a much different experience than what Google is delivering on the other end, right? Where it's primarily text-based. That's really translating well with Gen Z. And Google, Google actually has less than 50% of the search market share with Gen Z if you factor in TikTok. And that to me is a, a phenomenally amazing stat because no one's been able to unseat Google, no matter what they've done. Bing, I, I, I don't think it even has 5% of global searches. Um, I don't think any other platform really has too many either. Even YouTube is the uh, second largest search engine today. Maybe not if you're looking at TikTok, but Google owns YouTube. So that's, that's pretty crazy, right? So what Google's actually started to do in the past, you know, two weeks to about a month or so, maybe maybe two months now, is they've actually started to try to include more short snippet videos into their search results in an effort to get this market share back on Gen Z. Now, will that work? Kind of remains to be seen. I'm not sure, uh, but you know, TikTok TikTok is coming in, and, and they've they've actually got a place here beyond just being a social media network. Now, in terms of what that means for businesses, you know, can you can you leverage this? Can you uh, can you really drive a ton of revenue through TikTok like you could with Google? That's the portion that I think it will be the biggest challenge for TikTok because right now, you know, Gen Z doesn't have the the pocketbook or the the decision making capabilities. You know, they're not in positions of power where they can do things on a, a business to business level or really drive you know huge consumer consumer trends, but they will eventually, they will eventually grow into those positions. They will eventually get that income and they will, they will be huge, you know, consumers going forward. So if TikTok can maintain that and they can figure out how to monetize that audience really well, then they have a chance of unseating Google. So when it comes to advertising, I wanted to give uh, a little bit of a breakdown of 
you know, where everything's been and, and where it could be going. And unfortunately, it is very difficult to find some projections from any, any reputable source whatsoever on where things might be going. Um, however, I was able to find this, this graph worldwide from eMarketer. And as you can see, uh, Google's still at the top, remaining fairly steady for the most part. Facebook growth has been slowing a little bit. And Alibaba and Amazon as well, slow but steady growth. Uh, but but slow, right? Um, so not a not a whole lot of change. As we just saw, though, you know, with current events and everything that's happening, you know, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, COVID, um, you know, inflation kind of going crazy. I know it is here in the U.S. I I believe it is elsewhere as well in, in Europe and and everywhere too. Uh, some of these companies are taking some hits, and you know, you look at Google and their recent their recent revenue projections are are much lower than anticipated. Um, Facebook just just rebounded their their last uh, earnings report, so you know that they're, they're they're doing okay, but not great. And Amazon actually, for the I, I want to say maybe the first time ever, has uh, reported that they're they're thinking they're they're gonna see sales decline in this upcoming quarter. So kind of interesting, um, but you know we're we're at like this little point of maybe maybe inflection where. Uh, there's there's a lot of change coming. You know, companies are talking about this next thing, Web three, the metaverse, all this stuff that can be on the horizon, but isn't quite here yet. And do we have the technology today at a, at a cheap enough price that consumers can get over that barrier, get into this this metaverse? Will they adopt it quickly enough? Will it be enticing enough that it'll grab a big audience? And then beyond that, how will we market to those people? It's a huge. It's a, these are huge questions that. I don't know if these platforms have answers to just yet. And I've got some slides on that we can we can discuss in a little bit here too. Uh, so we talked about TikTok as a search engine. And I, I apologize if you can hear my dog barking in the background. She's uh, she's a border collie. That's what they do. Um, but TikTok has the, the potential to become the first social media and search engine hybrid. And I think that's pretty crazy. Uh, you know, when you look at fastest growing social media platforms, and I believe uh, this one is, this is in the U.S. I tried to get uh, some worldwide graphs. I couldn't find data on this from a worldwide uh, perspective, but here's, here's you know, the U.S. market's pretty large and TikTok is growing like crazy here. And I'm just curious, you know, do you, does anyone think that TikTok has the potential to, to be able to unseat Google and become this? this huge juggernaut, social media, search engine hybrid. I don't know if we do uh, interaction on these generally, but I was thinking maybe we could open it up here and just see, have a little bit of a discussion. And I think it's a matter of time. Hello, Manuela here. It's a matter of time. It's you're saying TikTok is for the Gen Z. Mm -hmm. It's Google still, and it's going to be Google a few years from now. TikTok is coming, but uh, it depends on how TikTok would be now would be able to address their content to other kind of uh, generations, not only Gen Z. That's my two cents. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think it's fair to say. Anyone else? Yeah. Hi, Michael. Nice to meet you. Thank you for yeah. the presentation so far. I'm a professor of marketing, so this uh, subject really interests me. And uh, trying to answer your question, I think that as uh, the audience of TikTok gets older, this is when the application also matures. Uh, we saw that happening with Facebook uh, about 15 years ago. Then we saw that happening again with Instagram 10 years ago. And then it's just a matter of, uh, I would say, less than three or five years to make that happen with TikTok. As the audience matures, the application also matures. That's my perspective. So as you say that there is a lot of potential in the future for kind of that kind of a revenue, I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. Well, I absolutely agree with you as well. And, and just from an agency perspective and actually going in and running ads on these platforms, you can see too just how much more sophisticated Facebook and, and Instagram and, and their their whole advertising platform is for someone at an agency level, the amount of things we're able to do in there is crazy compared to something like a TikTok. 
where it's just it's just in the infantile stages. They're just kind of starting to figure things out. And you know, same thing. If you were to compare TikTok to Google, I mean, Google's just got this robust advertising interface, and you can do so much with it. There's so many different kinds of ads you can run. But TikTok, it's just really not like that. So I, I totally agree. It just it's going to come down to how they're able to uh, to capture that over the next three to five years. Anyone else? All right. Yeah, so I will tend to agree with the first two persons, but also to add that uh, it also um, resonates with the demograph. If you look at the age bracket of people that really use TikTok, it's uh, between the age of uh, 20 thereabouts, and you have a lot, um, a large um, population of people in that demograph. So as it also matures and is evolving, um, it may come to the, the stage of uh, Facebook and Google. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to just to tack on to that, I think that's a great point. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting from a digital marketing perspective is how brands might leverage something like a TikTok. And I don't know that that question is, uh, again, I think that's another question that still needs to be answered because it's difficult. I don't know how many of you are on TikTok or have, have used TikTok, but to just give a brief breakdown of the type of video content you see there it's it's very raw genuine kind of stuff whereas something like an instagram or or something that you might see on tv very polished right extremely well done uh you know you might see athletes celebrities and you know everything staged there's perfect script and everything like that well something like tiktok it looks like someone you know most of them are just filmed on someone's phone and then they chop videos together they toss in some you know, they, they do these minor video edits, audio edits and things, toss in uh, something that's trending and then boom, you've got yourself an explosive TikTok video. And it, it's just much different. And it's it's very different for brands who are trying to get into that space. How, how are you as a brand supposed to create something that looks authentic on that level? I think that's that's quite a bit of a challenge right now for most people. So I think that's where influencers start to kind of come into play. Um, but you know, the influencer market, at least in my opinion, is, is not what it, what it was. Um, you know, you have a lot of people now where uh, to me, an influencer is someone who in any given industry or niche, that person is capable of actually influencing, right? So, uh, someone who, who I follow, who, who I think is really good. His name is Dave Gerhardt and he's a B2B marketer to me. Dave Gerhardt is an influencer. Dave Gerhardt could influence me to do something differently as a CMO. But, you know, someone on Instagram who uh, is in a bikini with millions of followers, I think that's, that's what most people consider to be influencers today. And that's not really someone who's going to influence my B2B buying decision, right? So, um, you know, I think that TikTok has a lot of potential, but I think it needs, it needs more actual people who can, who can influence things beyond just uh, the people who are currently on there making funny videos or uh, you know, I, I think, you know, certain certain industries right now have a decent play like consumer package goods, for instance, you know, you can find people who do unboxing videos and stuff like that. Get people excited about products or uh, video games, right? I talked about how I like video games in the beginning. I think there's a, a ton of room for that kind of stuff on the platform right now, but I don't see too many people um, using it from for anything that's not B2C, really. I think it's primarily a B2C platform right now. Um, um, so, sorry, we have we have Mashilo with a question. Mashilo, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Dr. Tony. Uh, Michael, uh, the, from your uh, uh, perspective, do you see anything uh, done by Google to prevent uh, the new entrance? on this market. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, share with you my experience in South Africa mm -hmm. uh, in the line of uh, beverages and uh, alcohol. Mm -hmm. We had Coca-Cola uh, dominating the soft uh, uh, drink market for many, many years. Then uh, we had uh, Pepsi-Cola uh, who tried to enter the market more than twice uh, with little success because uh, Coca-Cola would uh, do everything to prevent any new entrance. I'm not even talking about uh, the insignificant uh, companies emerging. I'm talking about the giant like Pepsi Cola. Now in the line of uh, alcohol, 
you've got a, a, a SA brewery, which is now called uh, um, uh, Wadwood Miller, because they now, they've now gone in, in, international. So uh, they've tried so many times to uh, block all new entrants to supply uh, malt uh, 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 alcohol in South Africa. Uh, for many years, they succeeded. But uh, the past six years, we saw uh, emergence of new uh, alcohol, malt alcohol entrance uh, penetrating the market. And uh, uh, while uh, SA Brewery or uh, AB Miller was expanding internationally, but in the country, they, see they started uh, having problems with the new entrance and also competing very well. What do you, what do you think about uh, uh, Google with uh, all the new players coming into the forum? Thank you. Yeah, great, great, great question, Mishilo. I, I think, honestly, it's hard to bet against Google. You know, I think people have been betting against Google for, for years now and uh, predicting Google's demise and it just, it hasn't come, right? Uh, I think kind of the same thing about Facebook as well or Meta, Instagram, whatever you want to call them. But these, these platforms have shown a willingness to take what other people are doing and copy it and try to do it better. And in some instances, they've been able to do it. Uh, if you look at, I know your question is about Google and I'll talk about Google in one second, but it, if you look at Instagram, for example, Instagram was threatened by Snapchat early on. Well, one of the main features of Snapchat was that um, was stories. Well, guess what? Instagram added stories. And then guess what? Almost every other platform added stories too. And uh, you know, we had LinkedIn stories, we had all kinds of stories. I don't think people want all those stories. And in fact, I think most of those businesses learned, I don't think people want those stories either. So we've actually seen some of those recede, but Instagram's kept it because they've done great with it. Google and subsequently YouTube is, is making plays to get into that TikTok realm. So Google's trying to do it through, through YouTube in some sense where they just came out with a new feature called YouTube Shorts which is meant to be a much shorter style of video, uh, maybe, you know, 90 seconds, two minutes long. And it's supposed to be kind of a feed that, that acts like TikTok. What's funny is if you look at TikTok, on the other hand, they are making some changes to become a little bit more like YouTube. They're allowing longer types of video on the TikTok platform, which, you know, puts them in a little bit of a competition. So we're seeing these platforms kind of try to be like each other and do what the other one is doing. Um, and I think that's very interesting, but I, I do think, you know, Google's gonna continue to adapt and something else that they're doing too, Google, you know, Google's gotten in trouble for always putting YouTube video results in their search engine page and not going after a Vimeo or a Daily Motion or any other kind of websites where you could upload video. And Google's now incorporating more video and short form video into their search engine results because they want to hit that Gen Z audience and they don't want Gen Z to think about TikTok as a search engine. They want to be that search engine that has that same content. That's the best content that you could possibly get when you search for something. And, and that's, that's, like I said at the beginning of the presentation, that's Google's primary function. I mean, they have so many business ventures today and, and sure, some of them generate money, some of them don't, some of them are just moonshot projects that end up being nothing. But at the end of the day, the primary driver of Google's revenue are search ads. And Google's gonna do everything it can to maintain that. So I do think we'll see more beyond just adding in these uh, you know, short form video snippets to the results page. As far as what that'll be, I don't know. I do think it's interesting that Elon Musk just bought Twitter. Um, to me, I think there's a little bit of creative potential there where maybe Google and Twitter could become a little bit more ingrained given that Twitter is supposed to be where the conversation happens surrounding current things that are that are happening. I think you know Google and, and Twitter have this for, for a while, I felt as though Google should purchase Twitter, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, given where Elon stands and given that he wants to make some changes to the platform, I could see a little bit more integration between the platforms where maybe some conversations could happen uh, or, or surface a little bit more in the search results, too. So I wouldn't be surprised at that either. Oh, thank you. Thank you both. I have a question, Michael, if you allow. Uh, when we look at this chart, it seems to me that uh, a large part of the world is not taken into consideration here. And I'm talking about China. 
And yes. um, the, the slide before that, where you showed the steady growth of Alibaba and Tencent. And yes. That's, and that's quite very true, right? So as far as I understand, uh, China is very protective of its market. And as far as I know, like any company is dreaming about getting into the Chinese market. And I spoke to the founders of Airbnb, for instance, one of them. Uh, here here at Oxford, and you know, they have an army of people developing the marketing strategy in order to enter the Chinese market, you know, to find the niche in there. So what can you say about that? Like China is protective, but but also I believe, you know, Google and other leading uh, companies, uh, social media as well as the searching uh, engines, they are protective of the markets they, they, they are leading as well, right? Or how, how, how is this happening? Yeah, so the, the primary search engine in China is Baidu. And that, that's essentially, I would call it, maybe the Chinese Google. Um, when you, and, and then Tencent, I might call the Chinese Meta, and Alibaba, I might call the Chinese Amazon, even though, you know, so they, they operate in other countries as well. But just to give, you know, a, a quick kind of uh, surface level view of it for anyone who might not know, uh, those I would say were are kind of the, the comparisons. Now, the the interesting thing here is, I think it comes down to uh, these these brands and their. I don't I don't know what to call it. Ethics, maybe um, morality. You know, uh, when you when you look at the Chinese market, there's a lot of censorship, and when you look at where Google is based in the state of California. Um, you know, for those who don't know United States politics, California is is all about. Uh, it, it's just a very liberal area. You know, it's all about equality for everyone and, and all, all that kind of stuff and not censorship. Um, but if, if these platforms were to try to grow in the Chinese market, they're going to have to accept that censorship to some extent. And it, it becomes a question of, you know, are you, are you starting to alienate people in your current market by entering into this new one? And, and is that negative PR potentially worth it if you were to try to bridge that gap? And, you know, so far, we, we haven't seen the, these platforms really, you know, take that next step and, and try to capture that Chinese market. And I don't know if they will. I don't know. I truly don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm very open to other people's perspectives on it. Um, but to me, I just, I don't think at this point, it's a huge part of their growth strategy or something that they're, they're trying to go after. Um, and I don't know if, you know, that, state of current events in the world with, you know, the war in Ukraine influences that at all either. Um, but I, I do think, you know, we might see the Western world start to unite a little bit more behind some of uh, the, the, the Western values and maybe, you know, kind of getting away from some of those uh, other values as well. I don't know if that answered your question very well at all, but um, it's, it's a different, it's a tricky one and I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Gives me an idea, Michael, to conduct another session, another colloquium on the Western values. I think that would be very interesting. And which way to go? <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be very interesting. Thank you, I... thank you for an idea. We shall definitely invite you. Uh, we have <laughs> one more question. Matt, please go ahead. Matt is joining us from Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Hi, hey, Matt. Hi, Michael. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for. Uh, for, uh, for updates on, on uh, um, uh, social uh, marketing, for, uh, especially. Um, talking about, I just wanna, just wanna talk about uh, my experience on, um, on TikTok. Sure. Uh, I'm not on TikTok, <laughs> but, um, uh, but um, I had a chance to, to sit down with a couple, uh, um, uh, six KOLs um, from, uh, from universities here in Vietnam. And um, we were talking about how we can um, promote a technology a technology uh, program, right? Um, and my my view at that at that the time was how to make um, those messages. Of course, we brew our messages. We want uh, some attention on those messages, and um, from, from the uh, from the traditional content marketing perspective, I just want to make um, them as meaningful as possible. Um, we actually uh, spent some time, made those content videos, and um, we spread around and talked to the KOLs uh, on how they would think it would catch on or not. 
It was just, uh, nah, um, it, it was all right. But, um, you know, they want something more catchy. And, um, uh, you know, and in fact, um, I was surprised on, on how TikTok caught on, caught on here in Southeast Asia. Um, all of them uh, have, have had their channels, right? They are 16 and, and 17 year olds and 18 and 19. So basically, um, they all have their TikTok uh, channels and they all talk about their personal lives. And those actually uh, caught on, right? Um, they, uh, you know, they also did some, uh, I would say home shop, uh, they sell things, um, but, you know, they uh, uh, talk about, it, it, the, the content wise, it's more about their personal life, the daily activities, and that will seem to be, um, catching a lot of attention from the young people. So um, I would just, um, I think I, I just wanted to share that uh, with everybody, uh, some of my experience. At the same time, just think back to the um, education business, right? <laughs> because um, of course, you know, we, we cannot put those bikinis and, um, uh, you know, and skins uh, to attract young people, but, you know, if we do whatever it takes um, to, to get the attention and, and the attention I think is key. Um, so uh, based on, on um, uh, the uh, research from the University of Economics, the, the young people here, they, don't, they, they are not um, focused enough to, to understand a meaningful content, something eye-catching and something um, that sounds uh, sounds good and looks good will catch it, catch your attention and then you can talk about whatever um, meaningful uh, content you want to talk about so um, nowadays here in Vietnam it's when we talk about TikTok it's not going to be uh, one video or one content it's going to be a series of content so when you you move people you you lead um, the uh, the audience into what you want to say and not just say it straight uh, from the beginning so that's that's what I just want to share with everyone from uh, uh, from Vietnam perspective. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's really interesting because you know I I've thought some of the same things as you when TikTok first entered the United States market. I thought to myself, you know, this is just another fad. I mean, there's no way that it's gonna usurp some of these other apps or you know push Instagram out of the way or anything. And here we are today, right? And I I think you're right. There's there's an aspect of uh, new flashiness and you know it's the it's the new thing on the block you know some of these kids start doing it and then they talk to their friends and oh you're not on TikTok well you need to be on TikTok otherwise you know what are you doing and then it just grows like that right um yeah the, the declining attention spans and everything I think is it's it's a very real thing you know I there was a study a few years back I don't know if it came from Microsoft I want to say it was um but it, on you know people's attention spans are now shorter than goldfish. I don't know. I don't know if I believe that personally, but, uh, you know, I could see it. I could see it. And I think social media is a big culprit of that. Um, and I, I think, you know, the more that we just go for these quick dopamine hits, um, you know, I, I kind of question what it's doing to our youth, to be honest with you, but, um, at the same time, it, it's, uh, it generates a lot of business too. So, um, yeah, so yeah I, I would agree too, because, uh, of all the clusters, uh, of, uh, of messages. Uh, so that's, it's understandable, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. natural that the young generation, they will get anything that's on top of their um, eyes and ears. So uh, as a university, for example, UBIS, I, I wanted to do something that catches uh, high school uh, um, students to our, uh, you know, study abroad programs in the past. Um, to, to be honest, it, it, it didn't work. Um, but I understand, I understand uh, why it didn't work um, because, you know, uh, it's very difficult to make a university look cool, right? <laughs> so it's, as, um, especially, um, I think if you have activities and, and you have like um, uh, barbecues, for example, that might look cool for young people, um, but that's not, we, we, or not, it's not what we organize, uh, you know, that often. Thank you. Yeah, so exactly. Thank you. Yeah, that's, oh, I'm sorry, Doc. 
I'm sorry, Michael. Ha have you finished with your presentation? Because then, if you have you have you finished I the presentation? I've got uh, I've got maybe four or five more slides left. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Sorry. Go ahead. Definitely. Oh, that's okay. I'm I'm enjoying the discussion. Honestly, I am. <laughs> yes. Okay. If you finish the presentation, and then we have more questions. So okay. That. No problem. So. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on, and I know that I didn't mention this when I was looking at present day, but I do want to touch on email as a future marketing channel too, because the strange thing enough is email is, uh, I think it's older than me. I'm 31 years old and uh, email has been around for quite some time and it's still an amazing marketing channel. It's amazing. Uh, if you look at some of the stats that, that we've got here, 3.9 billion email users in 2019 and the numbers projected to be 4.3 billion in 2023. So still on the way up and 4.3 billion people, just like half the world's population are on email. So that's amazing to me. And if you look uh, near the bottom of the graph as well, 293 billion emails sent in 2019, a projection of 347 billion in 2022. Now that's where things start to get a little bit in the weeds, I think, because maybe there's a little bit more congestion in email now. Uh, and or, or what's coming in the future, right? So while it still could be a great channel, everyone has email and it's clearly showing no signs of slowing down, it does seem as though people's inboxes are becoming a little bit more crowded. So standing out could be a little bit more difficult in the future. That being said, if you look at the ROI of various marketing channels today, email is at the very top. And if you think about it, it makes makes good sense, right? Once you have someone's email address, uh, you know you can pay for a, a, an email software. But outside of that email software, you don't have a lot of cost incurred to shoot people an email as often as you want to. And I think that's the beauty in email. And I think it often goes ignored because if you with someone's email address, you essentially get access to unlimited free touch points where you can put your brand in that person's brain again and again and again, as often as you want, as long as you're demonstrating value to those people. And I think that's a very, very important thing. I get asked a lot by our clients and just people in general, how often should I be sending email? And I, I think the answer is very simple. As often as you can, as long as there's value in that email for the person on the other end who's receiving it. And I could give a really good example. I subscribe to something called Morning Brew. And every single morning, I get an email from Morning Brew, and it tells me what's going on in the world. It's got all kinds of economic data, things like that. It's kind of how I stay briefed in the morning quickly. And they email me every day, and I love it. But if I were to receive emails every single day from uh, you know, a manufacturing business that I one time purchased a, a piece from, well, I don't want them to email me every day. There's no value in that for me. I don't want that. Um, but it depends on what it would be, right? And so... I think, you know, that's something that, that people need to think about as well. Um, but with as old as email is, it's just, it's not going away. So to me, email is still one of my favorite channels. I love it because it's not susceptible to an algorithm change or uh, congestion or user growth slowing or anything like that. Whereas if you look at a social media platform or, or Google, uh, let's say you're doing SEO and then all of a sudden there's an algorithm change and your website drops off the rankings. What are you going to do? Uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a really difficult problem. But if you're just sending people emails, you don't have that problem. You own their email address. You have it. They gave it to you. And I think that's an important distinction, too. I, I do think you should earn that email address in exchange for something. But um, to me, it's still an amazing channel and it will be going into the future as well. All right, so looking at some tactics here. Uh, and again, my computer froze a little bit, uh, but I think I know the first one off the top of my head anyway, and that's an omni-channel approach. Look at that, I did. Uh, so uh, one of the, the big things that we're seeing with the platform like Google, and of course, Google owns many different platforms. So of course they want to promote this from a business perspective, but uh, it, it makes a lot of sense because people's user, people's buying journey these days, there's so many different things that play into it. For example, I might hear from my neighbor across the street that there's a brand new lawnmower that uh, can 
you know, mow my lawn quicker and easier, right? Right. Uh, well, that sounds good. So I might, uh, you know, kind of forget about it though. So I might be in my house, whatever, and then I'm, I'm watching TV and I see an ad for this lawnmower. Okay, now I've seen that. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I have a conversation with my wife. Hey, you know, JT next door was telling me about this lawnmower. That's kind of cool. Uh, so, th so then I search for it and I go to their website. And now I'm on their website. I'm learning a little bit more about it, but I'm not ready to buy yet. You know, I was just interested in it. So I leave and then I'm on social media and all of a sudden I see, you know, it comes up in social media. Someone's sharing something about it. They're talking about their new lawnmower. So I'm like, man, you know, that, that is kind of cool. So then I go online and I, I watch some videos on it. You know, how does it actually operate? Let me see it in action. So I go to, I go to YouTube and then I'm watching it. Uh, and then, you know, I start reading reviews because I'm thinking about purchasing it and I want to make sure that I'm getting value. Uh, and, and these are just, and I could keep going, right? And then maybe I have a conversation with my friend and then uh, maybe, you know, I see it posted in a, a group uh, somewhere where I follow things. You know, these things are all a part of that buyer's journey today and it's fragmented. And I think that one of the biggest mistakes we make as, as marketers, and I know as an agency, it's sort of a double-edged sword for us because we have to prove our worth to our clients, but there's no way that we could possibly document this entire buyer's journey. There's no way. I don't know if you had a conversation with your neighbor. I'm never going to be able to track that. Uh, the best I could do is maybe put something on my website that says, how did you hear about us? And hope that you can accurately report all 99 touch points of this journey of how you got here today. But there's no way. There's no way that I can reliably expect that from all my consumers. So um, it is interesting, but uh, in order to truly be successful today, I do, and, and in the future, I do think brands are going to have to adopt an approach that's, that's pretty multi-channel. So, um, you know, again, just you know, something else that we see a lot at our agency and our experience, we'll get clients who come to us who their entire business is built off Facebook ads. And, you know, with iOS 14 and some of these updates from Apple, privacy concerns have, have made getting some of this data harder. They've made the audience pools smaller. There's more people competing for less people. There's less users on Facebook because they've, they've lost some user growth. And this, this entire business revolves around just running those Facebook ads. Well, to me, that's trouble. And I, I would not, if I was running a business today, I would not rely just on a single channel. And, you know, we see it with some of these, uh, these companies, you know, ad costs start to rise on a given channel and and they, they have no other out. So um, to me, multi-channel approach, definitely the way to go now and in the future. Moving forward, something else that uh, we're seeing, again, in the present day, it, it's starting to happen. And these are dynamic creatives. And the, the beauty in these dynamic creatives is that we can rely on machine learning to do a lot of things better than humans. There are still definitely things that humans do better than machine learning. You got to put in the right inputs. You got to tell it to learn from the right things. And, and that's absolutely the case today. And I think it will be in the future too. Uh, and strategy, all that needs to come from humans. But when you can automate something, you probably should. And some, a lot of these platforms today, you know, these, these algorithms, thousands of things at any given time. Um, where a human being just could not do that, right? I can't sit there in real time and say, oh, I'm going to bid more money on Matt because I think he's more likely to convert because, uh, you know, all these different factors and the browser he's using and things that he's purchased in the past. I don't have that kind of insight, nor do I have that ability to do that for on a, on a mass scale, whereas the machine learning algorithms, the AI does. Um, so what we're seeing is... And, and this is, I think, a really great thing. More relevant ads for people. I think this is a great thing. I can understand why people hate it. I get it, but I love it because I like seeing ads that are relevant to me, but I understand why people don't. Um, but these dynamic creatives are allowing people to, to make ads that are more relevant to the people on the other end. So you look at this, this uh, infographic that I have in front of you here, you, know, you can put in one base template creative, 10 products, three CTAs, bunch of different formats, and then boom, you spit out 480 ads on the other side. And I, I think that's only going to get more and more robust as we go, that digital marketing is getting a little bit more technical and complicated like that as we move forward, but, but it's better, right? Um, so I, I think that's very interesting, and I think it will continue to be. And I want to get to the metaverse. That's what my last slide is on. 
Sorry. Ah, there we go. All right. Uh, so one question I get asked a ton is what is the metaverse? Like, what is it? And I think it's a phenomenal question. And I think there are a lot of answers right now. Uh, and I think it's still, you know, at that stage where it needs to evolve a little bit too. But I'll tell you from, from, uh, from my perspective, at least, where I see the metaverse going and what it seems like these companies are trying to do is creating a world where Bear, you can go you can in and you have a personal avatar and you're able to do uh, pretty much anything that you could do in the real world, but in this world, right? Uh, and it's characterized so far based on what we know by virtual reality. Uh, you know, you're, you're in this world. Augmented reality is something that, uh, you know, Google, Meta, um, I'm trying to think of who else is getting it. Apple is getting into this space as well. I think also Microsoft is. They're really banking on this augmented reality stuff taking off. And I think that's a little bit interesting because I just don't see it yet. I don't think we're there. Um, I saw an interview with Mark Zuckerberg where he was interviewed by uh, Gary Vaynerchuk uh, maybe six months ago or so. And they were talking about meta. This was right when Facebook rebranded to meta. They were talking about the metaverse. And Mark Zuckerberg was talking about these, these glasses that they're going to make for people to wear all the time that are essentially augmented reality glasses. And I thought to myself, I just, I don't, I can't see myself wearing those. I don't know from a consumer perspective. I just don't, I don't know. You know, if it was like a contact lens, sure. I think I could do that. And I, you know, that might be cool, right? It's very futuristic. It reminds me of TV, Star Trek, Star Trek. that kind of stuff. But if I'm wearing goofy glasses all day, I just don't see it. But as I'm saying that, I'm sitting here wearing my Apple watch. So who knows, right? You know, maybe they might do it uh, in a way that I'm not expecting. Um, but the, the main core concept of the metaverse are these virtual worlds. And we, we've actually even seen this in video games like Fortnite, uh, for example. It's a console game. It's a PC game. It's this game where uh, a lot of kids play it too. You can go in there and uh, it's like a battle royale kind of thing. That Travis Scott, who's a famous rap, rapper, had a, a concert in the Fortnite world in real time. And if you were logged in at that time and you went to that specific area, you saw the Travis Scott concert. And if you logged in at that time, didn't go there, you didn't see it. And if you didn't log into that time, you didn't see it and it was gone forever. So there's that real time aspect in the metaverse too. And I think that's important, but it doesn't have to be VR and AR as Fortnite has shown us. But how do you monetize that, right? Like how are, how are brands going to take this next step into the metaverse and, and advertise or market things or sell anything to people? Um, you know, like I can understand uh, digital items and currency and things of that nature, right? Like I wanted a new shirt in the metaverse. Well, I'm going to go buy a new shirt. And then, you know, the company providing that shirt would give it to me. But if I'm just a brand, how am I going to penetrate into, into that market? I don't necessarily know yet. And a lot of people think that the solution is going to be NFTs. I don't know about that. Just based on the, the, the technological hurdles of trying to transfer any kind of digital item from any world to any other world. I don't think we have that technology yet that, that it would allow us to do that. Uh, and then, you know, if anyone has seen differently or knows more about the tech space than, I, than me, please, please let me know. But uh, as far as I'm aware, there's no apparent solution to that issue thus far. So um, it will be interesting to see. And I'm, I'm excited about the metaverse. I do think, you know, there's room for digital billboards or uh, pretty much any kind of out of home advertising, you know, like a bus goes by and it's got your ad on it, um, you know, product placement, things of that nature, I think could definitely exist in the, in the metaverse. But beyond that, I'm just, I'm just not quite sure yet. So it's an interesting topic for sure. And that is actually the end of my presentation. So I'd love to have uh, and continue the discussion. Oh, Michael, uh, I suggest that everyone switches the mic on and gives a big round of applause to Mike. Michael, thank you very much. That was, that was nice. Thank you. Uh, Michael, if you stop sharing, thank you. Yes. Faces and uh, yeah, that's 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 great. Uh, we have a good question and a comment in the chat box already, but Martin, would you be kind to, to, to ask your question rather than me reading it? Right, okay. 
Um, I'm interested in whether um, government regulation um, could change the competitive position of Google and Facebook and so on if the um, if the regulator decides that um, they've got too much power that they're anti-competitive and that Google can set its algorithms to um, disadvantage products that have been advertising on other platforms and so on, whether the regulators could change the competitive space. The answer to that is yes, and they are trying to right now, uh, especially Europe and the United States view Google a little bit differently. Um, and Europe right now seems to be a little bit more concerned about user privacy than the United States does. Um, but also, if you just look at anti-competitive behavior and antitrust and all that kind of stuff, uh, Google's in the crosshides. All big tech is for the most part. Um, Apple is with, with their app store. Uh, Google is too with their Google Play Store, their Android store. Um, but also Google's gotten in trouble for, for the way that they manipulate search results. And Google's argument is, a, I, I don't think Google's argument is bad. I'll be honest with you, but I think it's a lie. <laughs> but I think it's a good argument. I think the argument is uh, Google owns YouTube. They know that if you put something on YouTube, it's coming from a trusted site. So why would Google not include YouTube results over other third-party sites uh, in their search results? Like I, I can understand that, but also I think Google's just you know prioritizing their own properties. Why wouldn't they? Uh, until someone slaps them on the hand, you know that's kind of what businesses do, right? You have shareholders, you have stakeholders, you need profits. You're trying to squeeze out every dime you can. Um, again, yeah, I don't believe Google, but I do think that governments are wising up to it, and uh, and there are some people in the space who uh, do some studies on search searches and search results and what turns up and, and all that. And they've done studies that show that Google directs more and more traffic to its owned properties each year. And it has been increasing. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're shedding light on this issue and governments are coming into it. And there, there have been some changes, you know, at least, you know, Google has communicated that there are some changes uh, where they're they're dialing that back a little bit, but I don't know that they actually have. You know, I, I'll wait for that data to come out to see that they actually have before before I just believe their word. But um, yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you, uh, Roberta. Roberta has something to add. Um, Roberta about metaphors. Yeah, thank you again, Michael. Super interesting. So what I said on the chat is that when you, you talked about Vaynerchuk, uh, if people uh, know who he is, he's a very, he's an entrepreneur guy, but he's quite funny. He's very direct, up forward. And he, he's really a guy that is hands-on regarding the business that he possesses. So I was wondering the conversation about them, Vaynerchuk, like, asking to Zuckerberg the real applications, you know, the real life of applications for business regarding metaverse. So do you see today, Michael, or eventually in the very near future, real applications for business regarding the metaverse and not just the dream inside Zuckerberg's mind? How do you see that? Thank you. Yeah, great question. I, I'm conflicted on it because on one hand, I think Zuckerberg is putting all his eggs in this basket. You know, Facebook is bleeding users. Uh, Instagram is not going to stand up to TikTok, I don't think, in the long term. And I, I think, I think Facebook, Meta, they, Zuckerberg, they they know this, and they need something new. So I think they're going to. I think this is kind of a hail mary, to be honest with you. I think you know they're they're trying to uh, to do. They're they're trying to hit a home run with this and um, will it work? I don't know. You know, I, I've heard people question the, the demand of the metaverse. Like, does anyone ever actually even want this? Is there any demand for, you know, a product like this whatsoever? I don't know. Blue uh, ocean. He's, he's yeah. trying to, to build this blue ocean. Like tell us what we want, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. And, and while I do think it's creative and I think if you, if you put enough entertainment value in it, People will come. Uh, but then, yeah, going back to your question regarding actual, you know, how do you drive business outcomes through it? That to me will be the biggest challenge that, that the platforms have to face. And uh, not only that, but there are a few different uh, virtual worlds right now 
Facebook owns one of them. Uh, Meta owns one of them. But will that one even take off? Will it be that one? Will it be a different one? Will it be different than we're all expecting? And you know, right now it's sort of this new space. And you look at, you can look at, you know, the dot com boom and everything, where uh, you know any any website that had a dot com at the end was, uh, you know, seen as a, a really positive thing. And right now, I think people look at the metaverse that way a little bit too. Uh, maybe not not to the same extent, you know, I don't think there's this unending hype of, oh my God, the metaverse and anything metaverse related is amazing. But you see, look at what happened with NFTs. People were buying these NFTs for, you know, small money and selling them for, for crazy amounts. And, and it's the same thing with, you know, crypto is a little bit different, but it falls in that Web3 world where, again, again, you know, I think that was something people, you know, traditional finance people didn't really believe in crypto. Uh, but now, you know, they're starting to come around. It might be that same thing with the metaverse, but to your point, I think it's very hard to connect the dots right now, and I'm not quite sure how they're going to do that. Right. Thank you. Thank you both. Kathy, please. So, um, so I actually was an early dabbler, as was some of my colleagues in this company, in what is now being redefined as the metaverse. And um, we were the first um, nursing school to add that um, virtual reality to train nurses. And I think that as we think about sort of the gaming market, I, I don't know that much about gaming. I certainly appreciate the passion and the amount of money you, one can make in that, but let's put that on the side. Let's talk about commerce. I think there's tremendous opportunities for this metaverse concept. Um, training anybody in anything is so much more uh, meaningful if they feel that they're actually kinesthetically doing it and they're in, that's how we've trained pilots for years, which is why we don't crash airplanes. Um, we're now training nurses that way, which I'd rather them train on in the metaverse than to train on any one of us in a clinical setting. Um, and so as I talk to my colleagues in New York who are steeped in this and this is all they do, they will tell you that the biomedical opportunities for the metaverse, the industrial opportunities for the metaverse, you know, train, like having somebody working on um, some, you know, some solar panel or, or um, machine thing that is literally having some kind of glasses that both allow you to see reality and augmented reality so that you are literally looking at, okay, what do I have to do? I have to cut the red wire and I've got to replug the blue wire. So I think the way the metaverse has been coined and marketed thus far is under, is, is sort of a buzzy word, but the use of augmented reality, not virtual, because I agree with you. I have virtual reality glasses. I was one of the first Oculus users. Um, and the big issue for me is you can't take notes, but you can imagine if that, if, if, my actual glasses had augmented reality and I could take notes and also see the demo. I don't know if any of you have done this yet, but I encourage every single one of you to go do it because when you are in that environment, you are in that environment, whether you're underwater watching sharks and whales go by, whether you're on a roller coaster and you start doing this because your, your body's reacting, it is, it is so powerful. It's just going to take a while to get all the promises out there, but B2B is really going very fast. I love that, Kathy. I, I think, I think you're, you're definitely onto something when you look at it that way. Um, what, what instantly came to mind for me, though, is a company like Meta and you know, their dreams for, for the metaverse. I think, it, I think it would probably be deemed a failure in their eyes if that's what it turned into, just given how much they're banking on it from an economic perspective. But but I agree with you. I think that's there's a lot of value there than what you just said. And and it's a different kind of value that I don't know that you could get that same kind of thing from watching a video, right? You know, you, you got to be kind of hands-on and doing it. But um, yeah, great point. Um, but if metaverse becomes a word like Google, he owns the word. So I don't know that he thinks of it as a failure. I think the guy just wants to dominate and make money. I mean, and I, I'm a capitalist. I can't fault him for that. So I, I, I don't know that 
20 years from now, we won't be using this feature in most of our intuitive daily lives. Sure. So, I don't know. We'll see. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And, and he'll own the word. <laughs> the thing is that everything is, ch is changing so rapidly these days. And it's maybe even faster than 20 years, Gatti. That's the thing. Uh, I know the at least from the top of my mind, like three groups here in Oxford dealing with virtual reality and you know, uh, thinking about how to actually design the classes, different subjects, history in particular, in this virtual reality and to put the, the student into that, like ancient Rome <laughs> or, or something like that. And um, yes, I had some experience of that. That was quite fascinating, but I can't imagine how much work is needed just kind of in order it to put it on the big, big scale. But Michael, if you don't mind, uh, I have a kind of, a, uh, how can I say, more practical questions. Sure. So one of the outcomes uh, of a COVID-19 and, uh, you know, one of the positive, surprisingly, outcomes was this online learning. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that that's the sale in, in, our, in our universities. Uh, the wind in our universities is sales, and uh, I think Ubis is doing great, and this call is the illustration and the example of that, that we have people, you know, from so many different parts of the world, you know, on this call, educating, so I think that's great, I personally absolutely love it, so uh, I would appreciate some recommendations from you as a marketing specialist, how could we position ourselves and, you know, brand ourselves in the world, uh, in order to, you know, win this competitive edge and to, to be better known. So, Michael, I understand that's your professional sure. <laughs> kind of thing. But if you could provide us with, you know, several pieces of advice, we would really appreciate that. Right, Kathy? <laughs> sure. Is, what do you think with all this online, online learning? Yeah, well, I can I can speak to this from uh, the point of view of a of a customer as well. I I, I didn't go to Ubis specifically, but I, I did study online. I did my entire MBA online, so I I can then you know kind of see what I was looking for, right? Um, and I think there are I think I essentially have two answers to this question. First and foremost is you're going to want to look at and you I'm sure you've done this up to this point too. So I don't know that my answer is going to be extremely groundbreaking because you're you're doing very well, but uh, you want to look at what your consumers want, what your students want. You know, what are they requesting? Talk to them. You, you, can, you can do polls, you can do surveys, you can do all that kind of stuff. But I don't think those things are quite as good as actually having conversations with actual students about what it is that they're looking for, because that, that's a lot more authentic. You can get a lot more genuine value out of that than you know, someone clicking I strongly agree or strongly disagree, whatever, right? Sometimes people just click strongly agree and everything if they like, if they like their, you know, that they, they, they don't really think about it. So to me, I think, you know, key in on that, you know, what, what are they actually looking for? And then the other thing I would really key in on is what does UBIS do that's either unique or compelling? And and I'm sure I'm sure if you if you really dial it in you can you can find things uh, that that are unique uh, about Ubis and I can just tell you one thing uh, just you know I, I went to Southern New Hampshire University online uh, small state in the United States I don't even, I've never even been to Southern New Hampshire I have no idea but I like their online program but it was not international like this uh, you know having being on this call and talking to people from all different countries across the world this is amazing to me. I'm, I'm, I'm loving every second of this, just so you all know, but my online courses did not include that. So to me, maybe playing up that aspect of it uh, could be good. You know, you get a more global view, more, you know, you, you learn about more cultures, more different points of view and everything. That could be something, but I'd look at what you do that's unique. And if not unique, then, then compelling. And I would lean into those things and relate them to what the students are looking for. Thank you, Michael. That's amazing. So what would be a must for us? Like what social media to have under our belt? Is it YouTube channel or you would recommend something else? Well, uh, you know, uh, man, my people ask me this, this question a lot and they're like, should I be on this specific channel? Should I be on this specific channel? And it, it's hard to answer that question because uh, you know, like kind of what we discussed with TikTok earlier on was you need to make the video look a certain way if you're going to be on TikTok. So I don't want to tell you go be on TikTok and then 
you, you know, you're, you're not capturing that element in the right way. Well, then there's no value for you being in the, on TikTok. No, no, not TikTok for us, no. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm voting for a longer attention span for sure than the TikTok sure. users. <laughs> I would hope so. Yeah. Well, I think right now Google is, is just, you know, still kind of the top thing. Um, you know, capturing search because because there's there's pre-existing demand already built into Google. If someone's searching for something, they're already looking for whatever it is, right? And if it's an online program, uh, you know, you can try to capture that through either SEO or ads. Uh, I think ads are probably going to be uh, better. I, I think Google ads number one would be like the number one thing I would say for you, Chris. If I if I just pick something out, if you're asking me, you know, all things aside, let's say you're you're going to do it very well. Google ads, number one. Mm -hmm. Behind that, I would say Facebook ads. Uh, and when I say Facebook ads, I'm including Instagram into that too. I'm including WhatsApp. They're all run through the same platform, but uh, you can get a ton of leads through Facebook ads. And despite, uh, and I, I know I'm going back to, I was like, oh, they have a duopoly and everything's going to be fragmented. Well, here I am suggesting those platforms again. But uh, when it comes to Facebook ads and stuff, you're going to get a lot more leads or uh, inquiries. I don't know what you call them in terms of terminology, but you're going to get a lot more of them from Facebook ads than you would Google, but they'll, they'll convert to students at a lower rate for sure. Right. Uh, Google, it's going to be more expensive to, to get those, those leads, but it'll be, they'll convert at a much better rate because those people are, are actively searching in that moment and they've put more thought into it then. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I think meeting the uh, expectations of our clients uh, would be definitely, definitely a must. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I have a comment from Lamin. Lamin, would you be so kind? Because that's quite interesting, as well as the uh, link Lamin provided about easy voyages. Yes, uh, it is voyage in French. Uh, voyage means travel. Um, Earlier this week, I saw a video uh, about the CEO of, of uh, Easy Voyage. He was complaining about the fact that uh, Google uh, uh, was decreasing their 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 um, their, um, uh, their business by approximately thirty uh, percent because of Google Flights. Because uh, when people are trying to 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 book their flight uh, online, they go directly to Google. When they make the when they search, uh, automatically you have uh, results from Google Flights uh, displaying. So uh, this was a big problem for them uh, for online business uh, for online, tra online travel businesses, and uh, that's why uh, I was referring to the question from Martin. Because in Europe, uh, even in Africa, this, this is a serious problem. Because Google is uh, is a very good thing, a very positive thing, uh, but sometimes it uh, it is destroying some uh, uh, little companies, little startups uh, in Europe, in Africa, maybe in Asia. So uh, that's uh, this is what I, what I, I was commenting. Uh, what I was referring to, to the, to the comment from uh, from uh, Martin. <laughs> thank me, you. Thank you. That, that's exactly, I mean, that's a very important question because that's yes. exactly what we are facing now, right? I mean, <laughs> that's the monopoly, excuse me, but 93% from your slide, Michael, uh, of the world search, right? I mean, Crazy. is this right? Is this, is this how it should be? <laughs> no, it's not how it should be. Absolutely not. <laughs> I, I will say, like, here's the thing, you know, as a digital marketer, it makes my life a lot easier, but, but that, that shouldn't count, right? That's not how it should be. So no, definitely it should not be that way. And, and to your point as well, Lamine, um, I, I saw a similar story to, uh, there's a company called Genius. I, I believe it's genius.com. I think they started out being called Rap Genius. And what they essentially do is explain song lyrics. Well, they did a little bit of an experiment because they thought that Google was stealing their song lyrics and posting them directly on the search page. Mm -hmm. They replaced all of their, I think it was um, all their eyes with an apostrophe or something like that. They replaced one character that they knew, you know, if Google's copying it, we'll be able to see that they copied this character and it happened. Google was copying them. Google came out and issued a statement saying it wasn't true, whatever, they get it from somewhere else, blah, blah, blah. I'm not buying it. They were copying it. So to your point, you know, 
they're they're stealing travel they're stealing uh lyrics off people's pages you know that that website i assume makes money by ads and they need to drive traffic to the site to make money and here is google just giving it to someone without even allowing them to click into the site so it's not good <laughs> okay <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay thank you i mean thank you uh, you know, Michael, participation in this call, actually, we interview your clients as well, because I can see in the chat box that some people ask specific advice, you know, for newspapers and so on and so forth, but that's, that's already to Michael, I, I would say. Michael, just to finalize today's talk, would mm -hmm. you tell us about maybe the most successful and exciting, I don't know, branding campaign or something that, you know, could be useful for our companies and companies our students represent? Something I've worked on impresses you well i mean yeah that you could think about like the most successful and interesting most um, successful brands as a whole oh i'm really interested in the campaign right i mean okay. campaign that was from your point of view conducted in the most productive and interesting mm -hmm. way you know for, for 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 people for clients well oh that's interesting i'm a i'm a really really big fan of car insurance uh, companies. And because, because they all kind of offer the same thing with slightly different rates, slightly different packages, but I love, I mean, they're, they're all marketing companies at the end of the day. They really are. Uh, so I'm a big fan of the ways that they go about trying to differentiate themselves. And sometimes it's, you know, so they all say lower rates. They all say things like that, but they've all essentially gotten behind some type of, uh, spokesman. Like State Farm has Jake from State Farm. Uh, Allstate has Mayhem, which is my personal favorite. I'm a big fan of that. Um, uh, they Allstate also has, uh, you know, there's their general spokesman and everything too. So Geico has the, the Lizard. These are all US. I don't know, you know, how much they do overseas and everything too. But um, to me, like, I, I really enjoy just the way that they try to differentiate themselves. But if I could pick out one, a uh, specific thing, one one story maybe just to tell everyone. I don't know if it's uh, common knowledge or not, but I think Steve Jobs was an absolutely phenomenal marketer, but he wasn't always. Uh, so when Steve was first at Apple, he, he was there. He was there twice. At one point, he he left Apple, and he had come out with uh, the Mac at at, at at MacBook, I believe, at the time. And what he did was he took out. I think it was a seven page ad in the Wall Street Journal or New York Times or some big newspaper in America. And he listed out all the specs for his, his brand new machine. And it was, it was highly technical and it was seven pages worth and it bombed. It did so bad. It did, it was just terrible. So Steve eventually left Apple amid a ton of criticism and where he went was Disney, Pixar. Uh, or something of the nature. It was like one of those companies like that. And he learned the art of storytelling. And if you look at Apple's marketing after Steve came back from that, he completely changed everything that he was doing around like the whole thing. Rather than listing out features, he described benefits. Rather than listing out, uh, you know, basically what he did was he he showed the vision of who you want to be and his products would unlock that for you. They would allow you to be who you want to be. So when you look at Apple products, you know, you think of these creative thinkers, young, uh, whatever. My, my whole agency uses MacBooks and it's probably in part because of their marketing. Um, but Steve would, would tell the story, not based on the specs, uh, you know, the, the features and everything features are great, but benefits, benefits sell, you know, how can these features help you unlock that desired state that you don't currently have. Steve, Steve learned that. And you can see it with, to give you a particular campaign to actually answer your question, if you look back at the iPod when it, was, when it first came out, mm -hmm. uh, rather than saying, you know, it can hold uh, uh, X amount and it has so many megabytes, whatever, the, the tagline was 10,000 songs in your pocket because that's, that's what you want, right? You want 10,000 songs in your pocket. It's not about... Uh, you know, the, the storage size or how it links to your computer or anything like that. He, he literally said it's 10,000 songs in your pocket. And think about how cool that is. You can impress all your friends. You can do all yeah. different kinds of things. So I really personally like that. And I think if anyone 
ever just wanted to look at a master marketer and at work, look up any of Steve Jobs keynotes for Apple and just, just watch him. Uh, and there's also one other video on YouTube where Steve deals with some criticism from the crowd and he, he takes a, a long pause and then he goes through and starts explaining. So I, I think he's just absolutely phenomenal. And there's, there's a lot that can be learned from him in a variety of ways. Thank you, Michael. I, I absolutely agree with you. I think he was the first one. He was a pioneer because later on uh, we saw in different brands when they stopped selling actual products, but rather the lifestyle, you know, with like mm -hmm. different brand trainers, for instance, that was more like be healthy, get this great life, not rather buy my, my trainers. <laughs> yep, exactly. So, yeah, so that, that's, kind of, yeah, but I agree. I think the idea was from him and by him generated. And also the other uh, jobs a point that was when he dropped the university and he took classes uh, about, you know, how to write nicely, something like that. And that was an absolute class, you know, with no point. Uh, but then he said that that knowledge was used when they developed the list of different forms. We are mm. actually having the advantage and the possibility of using nowadays. So just to finalize this talk, I want to say that every bit piece of knowledge is going to be useful. And I sincerely believe in that. Like it's never that these knowledge you're not going to use, so you don't need it. So that's why all of us could join this call, I think uh, it's absolutely important and we are going to get a huge benefit. So Michael, from your presentation as well. So thank you very much again, everyone. Uh, that's the end of today's session. Unfortunately, time flies. Uh, Michael, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, uh, please, if you share your presentation, that would be great, sure. Michael. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I just wish everyone uh, the very pleasant rest of the day, rest of Sunday, and take the best care of yourselves and your loved ones. And I think- Thank you all so great. much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, I everyone. really appreciate everyone sh showing up today. Thank you. Great Thank participation, you. great questions. Thank you. Thank you. That was a pleasure. Thank you, Thanks, Michael. Michael. Thank you, Dr. Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Tony. Thank you everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.